It's a beautiful May 1st, my personal favorite day of the year. Mostly because of Camelot. But, you know. All right, I think that we can get started here. Um, so welcome, um, my name is Lisa Kump. I am the River Science and Restoration Program Manager here at Charles River Watershed Association. Um, and today we're gonna learn about more about migratory fish camps and how they're both uh, being affected. We have a couple of Hermack Village dam removal up near New Hampshire. <laughs> or, yes. Um, so just a land acknowledgement before we move on. CRWA acknowledges um, that the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc nations are the pr past, present, and future caretakers of the land that we work on, you can see in this map um, an outline of the Charles River watershed and those traditional lands that they intersect with. If you're not familiar with Charles River Watershed Association, um, we are one of the oldest watershed associations in the country, founded in 1965, and we really focus on protecting, restoring, and enhancing the Charles River and its 300 square mile watershed by using science, advocacy, and law. Um, our program areas are pretty wide ranging from climate resilience and river science to education and outreach. This uh, program is part of our river restoration program, which is new. Um, you will learn a little bit about CRWA's dam removal initiatives at the end. So I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. Allison Bowden. She is a conservation leader and innovator who works across boundaries to develop and implement, and implement strategic initiatives to protect healthy rivers, estuaries, and oceans, and the benefits they provide to people, including clean water, climate resilience, and sustainable seafood. She specializes in influencing policy through sound science, building partnerships, and finding intersections among different perspectives to build support for conservation action and decision making. Allison received her BA in environmental science from American University and her MS in water resource management from University of New Hampshire. And we also have Noah Snyder with us today. He is a geomorphologist who studies the response of rivers to Professor and college, my former professor. Um, he received his PhD from MIT, conducted postdoc research for the US Geological Survey, California. Since arriving at Boston College in 2004, his research has focused on rivers and associated land management issues in New England, such as dam removal and increased flooding associated with climate change. So please join me in welcoming Allison and Noah. Let's take over now and talk about the Mill River restoration. All right, fantastic. Let me just get, get that into full screen mode here. I have a cat joining me. <laughs> She's very interested in this topic, so. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see so many folks out on a, a Monday afternoon uh, to hear about and engage in conversation about one of my favorite topics, uh, fish migration and uh, and nature. So I'll talk about the nature, jump in soon. Uh, so we work in all 50 states and about 55 countries around the world to build a world where people and nature thrive. And our strategic plan um, for this decade is focused on tackling the climate and biodiversity crisis. So we're, we're focused on, on to keep climate below 
change the 1.5 um, and protecting planet by so there are climates uh, which relate directly to the project I'm going to talk about. Uh, to uh, a solution, we help them be really and uh, um, by 20 world. So now I'll talk a little bit in Massachusetts. Oh, before I do that, uh, why we like nature-based solutions. Uh, probably joined this webinar, our familiar term, uh, came in nurture around 2009. And the idea is using nature and natural processes to create solutions for, for people. So uh, things like living shorelines, dam removal, floodplain protection and restoration uh, that provide for water and food security and uh, flood risk reduction for people. Uh, and basically, the concept recognizes that people are dependent on biodiversity. If we're going to meet the sustainable development goals, we really need to use nature-based solutions in order to do that. It's a, a big part of our toolbox. So now I'll jump into talking more uh, about uh, work in southeastern Massachusetts. So um, just to the southeast of the Charles River watershed, uh, the Taunton River watershed is about 500 square miles uh, headwaters in Brockton, draining down toward Narragansett Bay. And the story begins in October of 2005, when uh, we had about a week of heavy rain. Uh, and there was a series of four dams in downtown Taunton. Uh, that had not been maintained. They weren't particularly valued by their owners. Uh, they weren't spending money or effort taking care of them. There wasn't a lot of incentive to do that. Uh, so Wittenton Dam in particular was in very poor condition. And there uh, that's in the, the photo in the lower left there. Uh, there was concern that that dam was going to fail and that if it broke, it would cause a cascading failure of all four dams that uh, were in very close succession. Um, and if that happened, uh, 2,000 people in the city of Taunton were at risk uh, of being harmed in that flooding. So uh, it made the, the crisis made CNN and Time Magazine. Uh, so some of you may recognize some of the players in the photo on the right, Senator Pacheco, Ted Kennedy, uh, John Kerry, uh, Governor Romney, it was a it was a really big deal. Uh, fortunately, the Wittenton Dam was stabilized on an emergency basis. The dam did not fail, uh, and people were able to return to their homes and and businesses after a couple of days. Uh, but that kicked off an exploration of what can we do about this kind of issue and really getting people to pay attention to the 3,000 dams in the state. Uh, there weren't a lot of incentives. There weren't very strong dam safety rules. Uh, and you know, it, basically this incident was a real clear illustration that as the climate was changing and our infrastructure aging, uh, that was a really dangerous combination if we didn't really start to pay attention to what was out there take care of the dams that we need, uh, you know, those that provide water supply, et cetera, and to really think carefully about removing the ones that we don't. So the Mill River in Taunton, uh, it's an environmental justice community because um, it was a manufacturing area, uh, really significant pollution, four dams in a row, uh, an evaluation by Division of Marine Fisheries precursor, um, this Dr. David Belding, 1921, said, uh, you're never gonna get the fish back in this river. It had been a really important fishery uh, in colonial times and of course in uh, pre-colonial times, but it was completely gone for over 200 years. And Dr. Belding said, you're not getting it back. So this was the condition that we started with, uh, but started to talk about, okay, these dams aren't doing anybody any good. The owner, their owners don't want them. What if we actually removed them? Because the, at the time, the impulse was to repair. But what if we removed them? 
why would we spend money on repair of dams that we don't actually want? So it took about seven years um, between October of 2005 uh, and the summer of 2012 to actually take out the first dam. And in those seven years, we did a tremendous amount of community engagement, a tremendous amount of science and investigation, uh, a lot of work on the permit process. Uh, and so that's a, another talk in itself, but uh, first dam came out in 2012. The first fish returned immediately after that. Uh, so in our, our monitoring, fish were there and ready to pass uh, that first dam. It took us another five years uh, or six years until 2018 to do two additional dam removals. Um, and the fourth dam, the uppermost dam, there was a state boat ramp on the impoundment. It's actually a natural lake. Uh, there was really a significant demand to retain a dam at that site. And so uh, the state actually acquired it. it. The dam that was there was torn down. A new dam uh, with modern water controls and fish passage was constructed. Uh, so that's the, the series of projects that took place um, that we call sort of phase one of the Mill River restoration. Uh, and it became a national and actually international case study of na four nature-based solutions, um, a term that really didn't exist. It hadn't even come up in the literature when we started working on this project. But uh, we showed that dam removal was the most cost-effective option. Uh, not that we can stop flooding in the city of Taunton going forward. Obviously, uh, the river will still flood uh, in the right conditions. but. There's a lot more flood storage along the river with all that flood plain restoration having taken place. And of course, the risk of dam failure is now limited to that one dam uh, that has water control uh, capability that the old dam did not. And uh, this is a Facebook post that Rick Ferreira, uh, the emergency manager for the city of Taunton, uh, who had been a member of the project team throughout. It's one thing for me to, to say the city is safer uh, we did actually update the, the FEMA maps. FEMA maps have changed. Um, and Rick, who is the expert, celebrated that the city was in fact safer uh, when the project uh, was completed. So uh, this is one of the most gratifying <laughs> Facebook posts uh, uh, you know, for a partner to make. We've been, so we, we reduced the flood risk uh, what that was a really critical component of the goals of the project. Uh, another critical component was to actually try to bring back the fishery that Dr. Belding said was impossible. Uh, we are up to, as of 2021, uh, we were up to 30,000 adults uh, passing the dam. Last year, the number was, was actually a little bit lower for the first time. Uh, so fingers crossed this year, we'll be uh, back on the upward trend. And uh, we had a PhD student, Matt Devine at UMass Amherst, who uh, spent four years monitoring productivity. So um, looking at what did the fish who passed upstream do when they got there, their objective is to make more fish. Uh, so we wanted to see whether they were successful in doing that. And uh, they were actually very high productivity. They were making very good use of the newly available habitat, producing lots of nice fat, healthy baby fish uh, to, to come back and contribute to both the freshwater and, and marine ecosystems. So uh, really successful on that front. So that was uh, I, what I referred to as sort of phase one, what we originally called the Mill River Restoration. But since then, of course, have recognized, uh, you know, there's a lot we need to continue to do to sustain the success that we saw from that project. And one of those things is to address drought risk, the flip side of that flood risk. Um, the waters upstream are, of the dam removals are a sole source aquifer that serve four communities, about 150,000 people. And that of course is a source of stress to the river. Um, the river was dry in a stretch in 2014, 2016, 2020, 2022, uh, not the entire river, but uh, obviously uh, fish need water 
And so this intersection of drought risk to the fish um, and ultimately to the people who rely on the water supply, we're looking at ways to uh, get water back in the stream, really focused on wetland restoration. So uh, increasing the recharge to the aquifer. Uh, and of course that recharge is uh, works both for drought risk, but also uh, can help buffer other flood risk. And I'll go through this super quickly, but the flood of record in the region, kind of jumping back to flooding was in 2010. Uh, we used all the experience um, from working with, with Taunton to address the flood risk you know, in this project um, as a foundation for the resilient Taunton watershed network, bringing together uh, EPA, Southeastern Regional Planning, um, and founding uh, this series of roundtables to work directly with communities on the impact they had experienced from the 2010 flooding and what kind of solutions they wanted to put into place. Uh, we used the experience from that to um, inform five years later the formation with Mass EPA, um, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, which now uh, 2.0 was just launched. And uh, finally, now uh, we continue to work at the scale of the Taunton River watershed as part of the EPA Southeastern New England program, um, continue, continue to work with the Resilient Taunton Watershed Network. Uh, there's a comprehensive restoration plan for the Canoe Snake Mill River watershed. Uh, there's a comprehensive restoration plan for the Asawamsit Ponds, Namaskat River watershed um, in the uh, southeast corner of the watershed, which provides water to a quarter million people in six communities. Uh, and to date, we've removed six dams, constructed three fish waves. Uh, we have another dam going to construction this summer. Uh, High Street Dam, which will open up uh, some significant new miles of habitat for river herring and reduce flood risk uh, in, in Bridgewater. So uh, it's really exciting to, you know, to continue to work on the, the watershed scale to really uh, increase resilience for people as well as improve habitat for river herring. So I will stop there and uh, welcome your questions when we get to that part, but I'll turn it back to Lisa. Thank you, Allison. That was a great, <laughs> uh, very high overview of how um, how this uh, watershed restoration happens on a huge scale, both time-wise and uh, area-wise. So thank you. Um, just a reminder to, if you have any questions for Allison, please Put them in the chat now while, we, while they're in your mind, and we will return to them at the Q&A at the end. All right, with that, we will switch over to Noah talking about the Merrimack Village Dam removal. Great. Hi, everybody. There we go. Um, uh, it's really, really nice to join you all today um, here on Zoom, and and thank you to Lisa for uh, inviting me to participate in this in this uh, really interesting webinar. And it was uh, great to hear Allison's talk just now. I uh, it's really exciting what's going on in the Taunton River watershed right now. So I'm going to talk today about a long term research project that I have been involved with here at BC. Um, uh, on the Merrimack Village Dam removal, which is actually in southern New Hampshire, um, and uh, on the Sauhegan River, and um, it's the lowermost dam on the Sauhegan River, and you can see the uh, removal in action, which this is actually the photo here uh, is from uh, August of 20, 2008, which is when this dam removal happened. Um, so I've got a couple slides just on dam removal in general, and it's it's certainly an area that I've done a lot of research in my uh, my career over the last uh, two decades, really uh, focused on the effects of dams and dam removal. And there's lots of reasons why dams get removed, and it is like an excellent example of a nature-based restoration solution. Um, but very often, dam removals are actually, you know, the, the sort of like a combination of factors, right? And we sort of heard that with, 
with the uh, Mill River case too, where like worries about public safety and liability dovetail with with environmental motivations and restoration motivations. And you can kind of get a like a win-win solution often going um, in in um, uh, with dam removal. And uh, the the graph on the right is just from a paper by uh, Jim O'Connor and others. Uh, it was in Science in 20, 2015, um, just showing how dam removal in re in the last two decades sort of on an exponential increase in the United States, and that's and that's just because of these combination of factors, right? That that uh, we have a lot of aging dams that aren't really doing much for us, in fact, are quite a liability in many cases. And there can be, you know, the restoration benefits and the, the flood uh, risk mitigation benefits can really outweigh any economic benefits of some of these dams. And so removal has become more common. At the same time, we have to make sure that when we remove dams, we don't cause negative uh, unintended consequences to the rivers, both within the former impoundment, within the reservoir, and then also downstream. And so I've participated a lot in dam removal as sort of a research opportunity um, in a way to study. Um, uh, in particular, I'm very interested in how sediment moves through rivers and tra dams tend to tra trap sediment. And uh, so dam removal presents a great opportunity to study how rivers respond to a change in the sediment load after the dam comes out. And this case in Southern New Hampshire is a really excellent one for that. Um, this is a paper by uh, Frank McGilligan and others uh, uh, from Dartmouth, just showing that New England is kind of a hot spot for dams, uh, especially old ones built in the 19th century and uh, dam removal. And they've happened you know, throughout the New England states. Uh, that's the right-hand graph there. Um, we'll be talking uh, actually, uh, oh, so the, I'll, I'll now highlight a couple of famous New England dam removals, starting with the one that really started, started it all. And that's the removal of the Edwards Dam in, on the Ken Kennebec River in Maine in July, 1999, which is really the first I would I sort of view as the first major dam removal of the modern dam removal era, and it was the first time that a really a, a good sized dam on a major river was removed intentionally, primarily for environmental, um, uh, you know, restoration uh, uh, motivations. And since then, you know, hundreds more have been removed. I just point you to there's a great article actually on that dam removal done by John McPhee at the time. It's in the it was in the New Yorker and it also is in McPhee's book, The Founding Fish. So if you're interested in in uh, the sort of history of dam removal in New England, that's a great a great uh, chapter of the Founding Fish book to check out. And on the subject of fish, um, the uh, you know almost immediate or very quickly after dam removal, anadromous fish species like blueback herring um, came in you know accessed the river upstream of the dam because the in this case the Edwards Dam was the lowermost dam on the on the Kennebec River in Maine so and it didn't have adequate fish passage so it opened up uh, a bunch of tributaries to spawning of uh, in this in this case. Um, uh, blueback herring. Um, following that, another major dam removal in New England, or sort of a series of dam removals, uh, was done on the Penobscot River. And um, and again, the motivation, a, a big piece of the motivation in the Penobscot River uh, restoration project was to open up the watershed to make the watershed accessible to sea run fish. And um, it involved several dam removals, um, here, one of which is the Great Works Dam in Orono, Maine. Um, another was the Vizi Dam, which is the lowermost dam on the Penobscot. And here's a picture of basically the day the removal started on the Vizi Dam. It appeared, here's a, there was a Globe article about it. It was a fairly major restoration project. And really, in the case of the Penobscot, again, motivated by migratory fish. Um, a big piece of the motivation was, uh, you know, the Penobscot is uh, a river with uh, pretty much the most the 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 most uh, sea run Atlantic salmon in the lower 48 at this point, and um, or really in the United States because Atlantic salmon are only in the east. Um, 
And uh, so a lot of the motivation for the Penobscot restoration was, was uh, around restoring um, uh, salmon migration. Um, so shifting gears slightly, so dams, um, I have lots of slides about what dams do to rivers. And here's just a textbook picture of when you put a dam in and you create a reservoir, that reservoir is a still water, you know, changes a flow, a swift flowing river into a still water environment. And so sediment tends to build up in the reservoirs. So here's just a major example, the Elwha River and Lake Aldwell, this is created by a dam. You get sedimentation at the upstream end of the reservoir where the river enters the lake or the reservoir and, and sediment you know, that is moving through the river accumulates there. And in this case, forming what's called the Delta. And a lot of my research now is on kind of these interactions between rivers and reservoirs and how deltas build in reservoirs and how that leads to effects of dams, not just in the reservoir, but in rivers upstream of the res in the river upstream of the reservoir. And I'm sort of learning a lot about a lot of my research right now is on sort of the legacy effects of dams and even how how after dam removal sediment pers persists in the river valley that was trapped there by the dams. Um, so it's worth pointing out that um, in Massachusetts, a lot of our dams uh, there's a very, uh, you know, especially in Eastern Massachusetts, the unlike Washington state, like this picture, there's a, it's a very low relief environment, not very, there's not very high hills, there's not very thick soils, there's not steep mountains, there's not landslides. So, um, so you don't have nearly as much sediment <clears throat> filling in the reservoirs. And so sedimentation and then managing sediment after dam removal is a much less of a big deal in certain cases than it is in others. And um, a lot of the dams on the Charles River for instance, have very, very little sediment uh, accumulated in, in the reservoirs because there's just not very much sediment moving through the watersheds and uh, the dams are fairly small. Um, so both of which influence this. But um, the case of the Merrimack Village Dam actually had a lot of sediment, a lot of sand had accumulated in the reservoir and a lot of people have been studying kind of the evacuation of sediment out of reservoirs after dam removal. And this is just this graph just shows sort of um, in on the x-axis years after dam removal and on the y-axis percentage of the reservoir sediment that had been removed in that amount of time. So of, over in this case, it was just we had two years of study of the Merrimack Village Dam and you see this, that it's really fast. You see that the, the sediment is being removed quite quickly and similar on a similar trajectory to some of these others where like, you know, 80% of the reservoir sediment is gone in two years. Um, and so we're going to go to the Sauhegan River in southern New Hampshire. This is the watershed and uh, we'll... Um, it's a tributary of the Merrimack River, uh, which is an important anadromous fish river as well. Um, it's the, the Merrimack Village Dam shown here when it was in place is the lowermost dam on the Sauhegan River, it's just a half kilometer upstream from the confluence with the Merrimack River. Um, it's been there, there's been dams at this site for close to 300 years. Um, and uh, the modern structure was built in 1907. Um, and it stored a good amount of sand. And so here it is before the removal. Um, here it is during the removal and here it is after the removal. And you can see the much lower water and the re-exposed rapid, uh, just to go back through there. And actually I've got a time-lapse here of the removal process. So this, what you'll see here is, is basically, this is just a webcam from the summer of 2008 into the winter of 2008, nine. You can see the site being prepped for the dam removal here. Um, and it, it's amazing how fast you'll see that the actual removal happened over just a few days in August of 2008. Um, and see, nothing's happening here for a good chunk of time for the during the summer. And we were studying the site and doing some initial surveys of the of the of the sediment in the reservoir and of the shape of the river valley downstream. Whoops, it's all gone. Dam's gone, re-exposed the rapids redoing, you know, kind of uh, taking out some of the lingering uh, construction materials. They did do some rip wrapping on the bank here, 
just to protect uh, Route 3 there. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, but incredibly quickly, the sand that was in the reservoir upstream uh, evacuated out. And that's what we studied um, in, in uh, the work that I've done there. And in fact, I've been working there since 2007 with uh, my colleague, uh, Matt Collins here in the middle. Um, he is at the NOAA Restoration Center in Gloucester. And I've had, you know, it's been a great collaboration over now, you know, 15 years or so, um, where Matt and I have co-advised a whole bunch of students from here at BC, masters and undergraduate students at BC, uh, studying aspects of this dam removal. And um, uh, it's just been a, it's just been a, a terrific, a terrific kind of long-term field site for us and a great, fascinating place to study how a river changes after a dam removal. Um, and uh, and and we've done work on the sediment and the vegetation and all sorts of other uh, aspects of the work and still have ongoing research in this site now. And so just to give you an idea of what the site looks like, here's here's um, an aerial photo from 1947. Here's this this crescent shape is the dam. This is this is uh, uh, the Daniel Webster Highway Route Three in southern New Hampshire. Um, the interesting, the Everett Turnpike goes through right about here now, but it's you can see it in this 2005 photo, but it didn't exist in 1947. Um, so there it is. This is Merrimack High, Sc high School. Um, and you can see this is uh, in 2005 before the dam removal. You can see the crescent shape of the dam there. So you can see, you know, there's the dam. Here it is, you know, in 2005, you can see it's shallow here, but by 2005, there's islands exposed. So there's been ongoing, you know, considerable ongoing sedimentation in that time. And then after the dam removal, here's uh, April 2010, uh, the dam is gone and the river has cut down in and already eroded away a lot of the, the one of these islands completely and, uh, and is, you know, re-exposed rapids up in here and is, you know, just really changed a lot. And so, Here's a, a drone video of, of the dam site. Uh, this is in um, the summer of 2018, I believe. Um, and the dam was right here, basically. Again, this is that, this uh, it's actually a historic bridge. Um, the dam was kind of right across there um, before. Uh, the webcam that we looked at before was, was over here looking back towards us. And then if we go upstream, if we look upstream, this is the former impoundment. So the water level was up here and it dropped about three meters, about 10 feet after the dam came out because the dam was about 10 feet high. And the river cut down into the sediment, the sand that was deposited here. This island still remains, but the most of the most of the sediment that was in the impoundment has been has been removed. And you have this, and you have this free flowing river environment instead of uh, an impoundment um, at this point. And that's the Everett Turnpike off in the distance there. Um, so here's just another picture. This is before the dam removal. This is sort of at the upstream end of the impoundment after the dam removal very quickly. So this is two months after the dam removal. We've already excavated, you know, you can see that this is a sand, smooth sand bed under the water after the removal. You know that's all. All that sand's gone, and you re-expose the boulders of the original riverbed. This white pine is the same as this white pine. Um, here, so what we've done, our primary data that we've collected is is monitoring a series of cross sections marked by these pins, these rebar pins. Um, both uh, here's the dam site, so both within the impoundment up here and downstream of the dam site there. And we've kind of got a very simple sediment budget that we keep track of the change in the storage in the up of sediment in the upstream part in the impoundment and the change in storage in the downstream part um, between the dam and the Merrimack. And so we keep track of that just by resurveying cross sections at each of these sites. And we'll look here at just results from one of them. This is the MVD 06 cross section. This shows all our data, all the times that we've surveyed the site from August 2007 and June 2008 before the dam removal when the water was up here. And then August 2008 is immediately after the dam removal and the waters dropped down a couple of meters. 
as the uh, and the river very quickly this is the riverbed profile the river very quickly eroded down uh quite significantly um in fact uh you know eroded something like three meters down into this sand um but then eventually actually stabilized and this is by 2021 you this is the the dark blue here is 2021 the river's actually quite a bit stabilized and is starting to build a new floodplain on the left side of the river here so this is what it looked like before the dam removal here's that new floodplain after the dam removal with a much lower water level and um just a, a cool aspect of this is we were we've been able to look over more than 10 years how the river has changed from the dam removal in 2008 um, this uh, this blue graph is the percent of sediment remaining in the impoundment. You can see that 50% of the sediment um, uh, was removed in the first two months after the removal. The, the top graph here is what's called a hydrograph. It's just the time series of the flow, the discharge on the Sauhegan during the time that we've been studying this site. And so there was one major event, a big flood, a recurrence interval of 30 year flood just before the removal in 2007. Um, and then actually we haven't had any major floods except this one here um, since the removal. That's what we're seeing here. You can see kind of annual spring floods, but nothing too major um, on that particular site. But um, you can see that uh, by two years after the removal, another another uh, uh, another fifty percent. We're down to about twenty five percent of the impounded sediment, and um, and there was this ten year flood. That's the biggest flood that's happened since the removal, and that did cause additional erosion. And since that flood, relatively little has happened. We've only gone from about twenty five percent to seventeen percent of the of the sediment remaining in that in that time, um, and. And at this point, all of the sediment that got stored in the downstream part of the reach, um, this 100% line would be would be you know where where it was at prior to the dam removal. A lot, some of the sediment that was liberated after the the removal got stored in the downstream part afterwards. Uh, but then, but by uh, but basically between our 2018 and 21 2021 surveys all that sediment is now gone as near as we can see so the the long-term effect of that sediment is 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 really fairly short in the time scale of the river and one of the cool things about this site is that we it's it's a really unusually well studied dam removal and it can and it lends a lot of confidence to projects where um if there is sediment in the reservoir that it it turns out that that sediment doesn't, as long as it's not contaminated, which we were, which we had their separate studies had done to make sure that it wasn't, as long as it's not contaminated sediment, the the effects that there there really weren't negative effects of that sediment in the long term, uh, the long there weren't you know sort of negative impacts of releasing that sediment all at once with no management at all. Um, in terms of like dredging or something like that. And so this is just some sort of science take homes from the Merrimack Village dam removal, very rapid initial incision into the reservoir deposit, and then much slower afterwards, really modulated by when there's big floods. Um, and one of the cool things we learned is that reservoirs can actually uh, be sediment sources during big flood events, um, when sediment can actually be scoured out of the reservoirs. Um, and and we've, another thing that we've learned is that there still is sediment um, stored in that river valley, but it's really outside of the former impoundment. Um, and that's something that I've got some ongoing research uh, on right now. And so that's my little story about sediment in the Merrimack Village Dam. And I will also just mention that um, the, this part of the motivation for this project, this dam removal, was fish passage. Although bigger, the bigger motivations were that the dam owner was concerned about liability and and um, and factors like that. Um, so uh, it was a little bit less of a fish passage removal than some others, but it's always kind of a it's almost always a mix of motivations when a dam removal comes out. All right, I think I've taken enough of your time. Uh, thank you for your attention and look forward to questions. All right, thanks so much, Noah. That's so interesting. <clears throat> As a sediment person myself, obviously, I'm particularly interested. <clears throat>
um, in the sediment story. And I know we've had questions around sediment come up on some of our Charles projects as well, um, which leads me to the transition um, to introduce our climate resilience specialist at CRWA, Robert Kearns, who is gonna be talking briefly about some of our priority dam removal projects in the Charles River watershed. And I will just share my screen. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Allison and Noah, for talking about some of the dam removal stories that, that came before us here in the Charles River. And similar to what Allison was saying, we do have records in the Charles River of from state biologists saying that the Charles River was essentially dead in the 1920s as well. And they really didn't see and think that the fish would come back and that the river could be restored. But thankfully, through great work from our people that came before us, uh, we, we've seen a, a rebound in not only the, the, the quality of the water, but also in fisheries back into the river. We have, similar to the other rivers that were described in the trials, we have migratory fish like eel, uh, American shad, rainbow smell, blueback herring, and alewife. Lisa, my colleague, who was, was just down there with the state at Watertown Dam, looking at some of the uh, smelt that were here. Uh, a few weeks ago. So we're, we're focusing on three dams right now, currently in the Charles River watershed. The first one obviously is Watertown Dam on the left-hand side of the screen. That is the first dam from the river um, that's not serving a purpose that we're really been, we're focusing on advocacy and, and um, education and organizing around. Second one, South Natick Dam, which is upstream of, um, on the main stem of the river. And the third one is Eagle Dam on a tributary up in Rentham. Next slide. So like I was saying, Watertown Dam is the first major dam on the main stem of the Charles that is really blocking fish passage. We have studies that have shown that they've been blocking passage of um, the female shad um, and other migratory fish like the rainbow smelts, which can't really get up ladders traditionally. So we, it's, and it's a 56 year old uh, significant hazard potential dam in fair condition owned by the state DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation. It does have a fish ladder. It's on the left-hand side of the river, which is, um, or left-hand side of the picture, right, river right, um, which is the more shallow side of it. And it's really, um, like I said, not really serving a purpose, but also it has concerns about um, the impacts that the ladder is having on not being able to pass the fish very effectively. So we're really looking at restoring the river here. And, and, and the picture on the left shows the um, present day view from California Street, the picture on the right is a rendering we, we did in the feasibility study as part of looking at um, what it would look like from the California Street of the River um, post dam removal. Next slide. The next dam that's um, upstream on the main stem of the river is the South Natick Dam, which is really a iconic location. Um, this dam is owned by the town of Natick and they went through an extensive process with a um, advisory committee, as well as through the select board, where they've decided that the town would like to remove the dam um, and restore the Childs River in Natick and save about 60 trees that are on the earthen part of the dam on the right side of the picture. Um, the picture on the left shows a rendering, initial rendering for uh, river restoration dam removal, looking downstream from the upstream part of the dam, and the picture on the right is present day. And this, this is really a great opportunity, like I said, to preserve 60 trees on the earth and part of the dam, but also uh, restore fish passage and um, restore um, the, uh, uh, you know, the ecology upstream of the dam, similar to what was described in other um, dam removals. Um, also, when we're thinking about, um, you know, fish passage, historically, the fish did get up to this point in Natick, but um, today they don't, um, the eels do. But it's sort of like when you're building a um, a sidewalk, you, you, you don't have to necessarily start and do it in a one one piece. So you can kind of we're looking really looking at opportunities to, to uh, improve fish passage all across the watershed in Natick, sort of you know upstream, but still because of the safety hazards of the dam seas, it's really a great opportunity to um, start looking at restoration in that part that stretch in the river as well. Next slide. And, the, and our last one is Eagle Dam, which is up in Rentham on a tributary called Eagle Brook. And this one is a dam that's in unsafe condition from a last um, dam inspection last year. And this one uh, also has a lot of trees on the earthen part of the dam that would have to be removed. Town has not decided whether they want to remove it or not, but 
um, there's opportunities for uh, restoring some habitat for some um, species of fish that are threatened, but also look at um, reducing the liability uh, that this structure has. And this dam has failed in the past um, a couple of times. So th that's a really a big concern for the town is any liabilities associated with uh, the dam. Next slide. And now we're going to transition to talking about uh, questions and answers. And I know you all have been putting your questions into the chat and I'll pass it back to Lisa to facilitate that. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. So we've got um, one question in here um, for all of you out there who may have other questions about the presentations or tangentially about uh, dams and mig migratory fish. Please put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can call on you to unmute. So here's kind of a general question for either Noah or Allison from Thomas Connors. Is there any hope for dam removal on beautiful rivers like the Deerfield where the dams are currently being used for hydropower? Who wants to take that? I'm happy to start. Uh, we've actually been working for, for years on relicensing on the Connecticut River. Um, you know, hydro is an, an important part of our energy mix. And like the Edwards Dam that Noah talked about, some quote unquote hydro dams aren't making much power. Uh, I don't know that much about the, the Deerfield and kind of the status of licensing there um, or, you know, how much megawatts are, uh, you know, being produced by, by each of those. But I think we should always, I mean, rivers are public trust resources and dams are using them. Uh, that's why we have a licensing process. And so I don't think we should ever sort of just um, assume that hydropower is the highest and best use of, of a river. Uh, you know, Edwards showed that we actually can take dams out. Uh, you know, Penobscot dams were removed and others reoperated. So I, I think that that model is something that is really critical. Um, you know, for us to look at it, even the for dams on the Merrimack, uh, you know, what are what are the options there? So it's not a very direct question. I don't know that much about the details of the Deerfield. Only that I don't think we should assume that hydro is is forever, particularly as new sources of renewable energy are are developed. No, do you want to comment on that one, or yeah, I'll just say that like. I think it is interesting how I think the conversation has changed a bit over the decades. Like when I got to BC 20, almost 20 years ago, I was, I've, I've been teaching a class called Rivers in the Environment to sort of uh, a not a science for non-science majors class with um, over that time. And I started off as, you know, being vehemently anti-dam and, uh, and now I've, I'm still mostly anti-dam, but, and certainly anti-new dam, but uh in the united states but uh but uh, as you know as climate change has become more salient in our need for renewable energy hydro can is pretty is pretty great uh as a form of renewable energy in some systems although it is never without uh negative environmental consequences and so i think that it's an interesting conversation around our existing dams now um as to some of them probably do have some value in terms of the renewable energy mix but there's certainly thousands <laughs> that uh if not tens of thousands um that aren't doing anything for us um and uh, i think it's those that are really the low-hanging fruit of dam removal right now Awesome. Thank you. All right. Great. We've got some good questions coming in. I think this one is for Noah from David. What is the ecological significance of what happens with sediment, both where the, when there is a dam and after the dam is removed? Thanks for the question, David. That's a great, uh, a great, you know, a great one because it kind of gives me an opportunity to say some things I didn't really have time to say. Um, but uh, so a lot of the, the issue is, you know, for instance, if you care about salmon habitat, you know, like in the Penobscot cases, or really any, almost any anadromous fish, 
spawn in the bed of the river. Many, many do. Some spawn in lakes and things like that. But many spawn in the bed of the river. And you don't want to change the character of the bed of the river if you have good habitat downstream, for instance. And so by adding a bunch of sand that was in the impoundment to the river reach downstream, um, are you going to change that habitat in some negative way? Worse, of course, is if the sediment is contaminated and you spread that contaminated sediment out downstream, which is a disaster and did happen on the Hudson River, as a matter of fact. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so being really conscious and being able to sort of model and predict the effects of sediment release after dam removal is really important, particularly in reservoirs with a lot of sediment storage. For instance, for instance, the Merrimack Village Dam was one, and uh, there are certainly others in New England or in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and then the ones out west, like the Elwha Dam removals, had huge amounts of sediment um, stored. And they, you know, that managing that sediment and thinking about and modeling the, the anticipated effects of that sediment was a huge important aspect of, of, of those dam removal projects in Washington state. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Sediment matters <laughs> in short. Um, <clears throat> all right, so another question for both of you. In all cases that were mentioned today, all of the dam removal cases, the entire dam was removed. Um, the question is, was it ever considered just to open up a smaller spillway for cost reasons? Uh, I can jump in on that. I mean, in like the state hospital dam, actually a, a big piece of the dam that existed actually is still there, partly for historic reasons, you know, disturbance of the bank. Uh, our object and many projects that I've worked on, um, actual complete removal of all the historic parts uh, and is not usually what we're able to, to do or seek to do, it's really giving the river its room back. Uh, so that's what we're focused on is like passage of flood flows, passage of, of fish and you know getting as much restoration benefit as we can without doing sort of unreasonable amounts of disturbance. Uh, you know, a lot of these things have a lot of infrastructure associated with them. And uh, you know, try not sort of biting off more than is necessary in the, you know, in construction. So it really depends on the site. And can I add on to that one, Lisa? And, and, and I know in the Charles River, specific Watertown Dam, I guess all the dams, the earthen part of the dam or the embankment oftentimes has trees. And when you remove, oftentimes as you remove the spillway or people colloquially know as the waterfall, that, um, that embankment or earthen part of the dam then just becomes a, a bank of the river or stream so you can kind of protect those trees and you wouldn't take that earth out is what we're generally seeing in the Charles. But in the past, we did do on the main stem of the Charles of the Bleacher Dam, there have been a couple of partial breaches to that dam um, to facilitate more fish passage. I think in the early 2000s, that was something that was done on both river right and river left. So that so that has been done on some of them, but um, I think the goal is for the full um, extent in, in river to be removed it, it, when possible. And I think that also speaks to the liability issue. If you have a partial dam that is impounding anything, then it will still be subject to um, you know, repairs and maintenance and inspections of the Office of Dam Safety in Massachusetts. Um, all right. And the next question, um, it was mentioned that certain fish species have difficulty using or can't use fish ladders. How effective are fish ladders generally, and are they a reliable solution overall? That's probably more for Allison. Uh, sure. Um, fish ways. So fish ways are designed species by species. Uh, Massachusetts has a lot of fish ways. Um, every major migratory fish run that we have relies on at least one fishway. So they are important uh, to the status of, of our runs. And uh, they work a whole lot less well than a river to move fish, their infrastructure. 
Uh, so they, like other infrastructure, they they tend to have one purpose. Uh, you know, the the best fishways, like the elevator on the Connecticut River, uh, you might get sixty percent or more passage efficiency. So a fish that comes to the bottom and wants to go upstream, how likely is it that they get there and successfully get back downstream? Uh, so there's a lot of variation, uh, including some fishways that basically don't work at all. Uh, so we need them. They're important where you know where dam is necessary. It's really critical to have good, effective fish passage, both upstream and downstream. And if we can get rid of the dam, that's always going to be the best alternative for river health and for uh, migratory fish. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but Thomas asks, um, there's highway construction near rivers seems to be a huge river issue that doesn't get enough attention. For example, 95 was recently widened, taking a swath of Cutler Park in Needham, where there is a lake and the Charles River. I understand there is a concern with respect to the rebuilding of the Mass Pike, um, the I-90 project near Boston. Is this issue getting enough attention with legislators and regulators and those who are concerned with protecting rivers? Robert, do you want to take that one? Well, I can take a stab at that. I'm, I'm not as involved as some of my colleagues on the I-90 project, but obviously something that we've been following and have been um, commenting on. And But speaking broadly, um, anytime you add impervious cover or blacktop like from highways, we, we're really concerned about the impacts of flooding and, and the more runoff getting into the rivers and streams and the water quality impacts of those, especially when they're um, the, the water is not filtered generally when they come off from the roadways. It just goes directly into the river unless there's some sort of rain garden or other um, green infrastructure to filter it before it gets in the river. So we're definitely following I-90 and, um, and, and have concerns about generally speaking about impacts of uh, the blacktop impervious cover on our rivers and it's can create more flashy and like I said, negatively impact the water quality, but we're definitely um, following following that project for sure. And there's a lot of um, work on advocating for legislators and, and local city officials as well. Like I said, I'm not, not as involved with that project in particular, but we do have people on staff who are involved, who aren't really, I don't think they're in the room here now, but um, but definitely get, get in touch if you have more inter information. Yeah, thank you. I'm definitely getting in touch. Um, another question around dams and the impoundment, is there a legislative solution to the undue power of adjacent landowners to stymie dam removal because the landowners enjoy having pond access and would be against any change to revert back to a river? Uh, well, I mean, in, in terms of legislative solution to private property rights uh, in and of itself, I mean, the, there are there have been plenty of situations where someone who did not have property rights, uh, if, you know, they they have the option throughout the permitting process to ex to express, uh, you know, concerns and and bring up and explore property rights. But if you really have no right to an impoundment, no water rights, anything like that, I haven't seen a whole lot of cases where uh, you know, projects haven't been permitted. There are instances where you, where the project proponent, uh, you know, kind of steps back and says we need to do a lot more work before we can continue. But from a permittability point of view, whether adjacent owners just don't want the project to happen, the dam owner has a right to for that to proceed, as long as all the issues that are addressed in permitting can actually be taken care of. I don't know if that made. It answers the question, but I, I don't think we need legislation for that piece. Uh, you know, and you can buy property from people, things like that. You know, if a if an owner, the surrounding property owner wants to, a dam to remain, they can purchase property rights from the existing dam owner. That's always an option. Awesome. 